you for that incredibly humbling introduction. Um, good morning. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone here has probably run into me at some point in the past few days. But uh, yeah, my name's Nora. I'm with Capital Home Care Cooperative. And uh, probably what I found most exciting about the cooperative movement is going from field worker to business owner um, and finding the power there. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about it with regard to my story um, and Capital Home Care. Um, <coughs> so bear with me. Uh, so I, oh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. I think that this tenant um, could not be more true than with cooperatives. Uh, a huge part of leadership that I want to talk about today was how everyone in my cooperative has risen to be leaders as well, and how we've all come to empower each other, like it's not a one pony show, basically. Um, and that's John C. Maxwell. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, again, my story, just my caregiver roots and uh, living, how I ended up on this quirky little trip out to co-op land, Washington, um, my really professional strategy of faking it until I figured it out, uh, and some tips and tools to help other people fake too, or how to help yourself feel empowered as well. Um, so I guess I just want to ask, uh, just like for two or three people from the audience, um, or actually, just raise your hand, how many people here have provided care to a family member? Awesome. Okay, next question. How many people here have a family member that they're worried about being able to receive care? Awesome. And otherwise, how many people are friends with a caregiver? Like they have a family member who's a caregiver, or you know, somebody in the community, or bartender is also your caregiver. Um, <laughs> and so I, I like to start with this. You know, I think we all know here that caregivers are becoming just intrinsic to what a healthy community should look like, um, and they're universal. Like it's not a one-person struggle. Everybody that we know in our community is facing those really scary questions. Um, so I started out that way too. I, this is uh, some pictures of me and my grandpa when I was a little kid. Um, he used to take care of me. I used to try to steal his drinks, as you can see from the left. Just um, <laughs> um, but first he took care of me. We were very, very close. He taught me to play tennis. You know, He taught me math. Uh, I spent a ton of time with him as a kid. And he started having TIAs and strokes when I was around 11 and 12. Uh, my family was low income, and so you know I felt very devoted to him, and I started at a young age. Um, and that kind of led me to go into professional caregiving. Uh, and as a professional caregiver, I started out in CSP working with people with disabilities. Um, I worked in DCF and CPS running programs for kids who had rescinded from the system and were waiting for placement. I was a human rights coordinator trying to hold, help with quality control in different agencies. I just hopped from place to place. And what I found in my constant search for something that resembled a living wage or something that resembled acknowledgement of my specialty and my value, um, I just kept hitting these dead ends. Um, and especially with the CPS program with the kids, you know, the caregivers there were making $13 an hour and working 17 to 25 hour shifts. Um, and they were getting beaten up, like they were getting hospitalized, they couldn't take breaks. Um, and you know, you just, the world starts getting really small when you're in that kind of, you know, you, you just can't really see how you could be hopeful or how you could, you know, want to keep doing this. Um, which was hard because I found a lot of value uh, for myself as a caregiver. Um, so then, my friend invited me to go across the country and join this weird caregiver co-op. Um, you know, and I was 28, so that seemed like, all right, well, either I'm just going to like die in a DCF program or I'll figure it out. Um, so I decided to do that. I ended up uh, at the Puget Sound in Olympia, Washington, um, suddenly in this really weird co-op spiral. Um, and I met the cooperative community. Uh, which was vast. I think this um, was probably one of the biggest surprises for me in doing this, is that it was almost like I got to Olympia and um, 
there were all these people waiting for somebody excited to help caregivers. Um, you know, and they started this project. So I met Circle of Life, um, PHC, the Northwest Cooperative Development Center, Deborah Craig, John McNamara, um, U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, also today, that's the way, um, <laughs> CDF, um, you know, and suddenly found like in this really bizarre quest that there was a lot of support. Like there was a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, you can do this. Let's open a call off. Like, come on, isn't it easy? Um, <laughs> and so I was skeptical. I was really, really skeptical. Um, the skeptical puppy is skeptical. I was sort of like that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, why do these crazy people think that I can run a business? What is a cooperative? Why would a caregiver be able to run a business? You know, these questions were not answered for me. Um, and it's, it's a pipe dream. You know, you're kind of like, is this real? Like, you know, what? Like, I don't know how to do payroll. That's crazy. Uh, and so, um, <laughs> so I figured out that I really, really wanted to do this. Um, and so my strategy was to fake it. Um, and I, you know, I kind of like <laughs> Put a lot of different things that were my first, where it was like my first client intake. You know, I was asking all of these questions that were really often like off, like depressing and um, really difficult. And you know, you just get through it, you sweat through it. Uh, one of my favorite like kind of things to think back on is the first time I met Deborah Craig from the NWCDC. Uh, coming out of my caregiver background, having all these people say, "Oh, you've got to meet Deborah. She's going to help you open this co-op." Um, and I was petrified that she would meet me and within five minutes be like, she doesn't know anything about running a business. These people have made a mistake, send her back to Massachusetts. This girl is crazy. Um, you know, but that's not what happened. She was incredibly, incredibly supportive of me and really asked me to envision the cooperative advantage. Um, so this is a high task for all of us, right? You know, figuring out the structures of running a business is its own task, but figuring out how you can solve that cooperative advantage to yourself, how to envision it so you can envision it for others is a real challenge. You know, what are the benefits of a co-op? How long does it take to get that higher wage? You know, what's the priority? You know, how do I make sure that these caregivers stay uh, included if they're all out in the field all the time? So lots and lots of questions as to how to encourage people to jump into this. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you guys just for five or ten minutes, um, just really in small groups, to take a few minutes and answer six questions. Uh, I'd love it if you could just discuss and list three reasons that would entice caregivers to apply to work at a caregiver cooperative, um, and three things that would keep a caregiver working at a caregiver cooperative. And if you have any time left while you're waiting for other people, I'd love it if you guys could talk about what brought you here, why are you in a co-op, and not just working as a caregiver independently. Um, all right. Um, so I'll just ask you a quick or anything, but can somebody raise their hands and just uh, name some of those reasons that would entice caregivers to come? All right. Bringing dignity and professionalism back to the actual job. Bringing dignity and professionalism back to the actual practice, is that right? Um, that's awesome. That would definitely attract me. Uh, oh, I see your hand back there. Um, you have a voice in the company. You have a voice in the company? Absolutely. I think that's really important. I don't think smart people stay at a table where they're not listened to. Um, all right, and I'll ask, uh, could somebody just volunteer something that they think would keep somebody there? <laughs> After that advocacy thing yesterday, I, I see that as a way to draw in younger caregivers, which we desperately need, um, that might keep them involved in a job where they felt like they're working for a higher cause. Absolutely. Advocacy to help attract caregivers and help them feel like they're working for a higher cause. Um, all right, my darling. <laughs> okay, me? Yes, you. All of you, but you. The flexible hours, because the young people, they switch jobs like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I asked my, my boy, my son, how are you going to settle down to a particular job? He says, I'm, I'm going to learn everything. <laughs> so anyway, yes, 
the flexibility is very attractive to the young people nowadays. That is so true. Uh, so do you guys hear, she said, she said flexibility. Um, it kind of brought up that the younger generation is more comfortable jumping from job to job. I think that's huge. I actually heard quite a few of you talking about flexible hours and flexibility. Um, and it's a funny thing that it's, Hard to build into a system. I'm right, going to ask for one more. Uh, one thing that would keep a caregiver working in a cooperative. So before I, I say what I want to say, has anybody had a job where they were yelled at for having to call out due to family emergencies? Okay. Yes. Right? Yeah, pretty much all of us. And I've never once had that happen at Circle of Life. Even the first, I mean, I've had to call out 15 minutes before a shift because of my son. And it's always, oh, okay, can we help you? It's not, that's it. You don't get yelled at, you don't get penalized, you don't, you're just like, oh, you're a human and, and human things happen. Okay, let us know if we can help. Did you guys all hear what Julie said? It was awesome. Um, absolutely, I, I think, like, and that makes me think of the compassion that caregiver cooperatives can bring. You know, if we all understand what we're all going through, then we can support each other as opposed to kind of ruin each other's lives. All right, thank you guys so much for doing that. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so this kind of leads to my most important point, which is employee training is a big deal. Um, reaching, your, reaching your caregivers, figuring out how to access them even though they're in the field, figuring out how to figure out if something is happening for them, if they're reaching burnout, you know, how do you measure somebody else's um, health and make sure that they're safe. So what I have worked on really, really hard is making sure we have consistent meetings um, open avenues of communication, like Julie said, making sure people feel that I'm safe and approachable. Um, communal problem solving, I'm just gonna leave that one there, but that's pretty much what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of this time. Uh, surveys and evals, and then follow through. Following through on communication. If you hear from somebody that they're, that they're feeling really overwhelmed, don't just wait for them to feel better. Check in with them, make a plan with them, um, meet them halfway. Uh, and so I'm talking more as an administrator. How many people here have had management experience outside of co-ops? All right, that's really hard to unlearn <laughs> in a cooperative setting. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, you know, and one thing that I think most managers in outside areas wouldn't love to hear me say is that I believe that every caregiver complaint is an opportunity for member engagement. Um, I think it's one of the most important strategies that I've employed in trying to make sure my caregivers feel like their voice is a part of our culture. Um, and I was given permission to tell this story. This is one of my favorite little anecdotes from Capital Home Care, where when we first opened, we had this ordinary 93 year old client um, who was not a fan of us. And one day he left his gun out on the chair while the caregiver was cleaning. And the caregiver was really freaked out, very overwhelmed. You know, you don't expect to find firearms while you're cleaning. It's just not the norm. Um, and so they were, you know, they were upset. They felt like they'd been put in an unsafe situation. They felt like, you know, we hadn't protected them from that situation. They were scared to go back. Um, you know, and I, I think about this a lot. You know, in a different situation, in my old management roles. You know, I can just hear the management culture. Oh my God, she can't handle a, a gun? Like, this is, this is home care. We deal with all sorts of stuff. Tell her to get with it. Um, you know, but what I did instead was I invited this person to come and have a meeting with me and I apologized and I said, okay, you know, there are 3,000 things that could come up that I can't always anticipate as an administrator, but this is a problem. What can we do to fix it? You know, can you help me create a solution? This is your business too. You know, you don't want other caregivers to find guns while they're cleaning. And this person so rose to that challenge. They helped me write a policy and implement it where with every intake, I ask about firearms. And if they do have firearms, we create a safety plan so the caregivers know if they're going into a home that there is a firearm and there's a safety plan. Um, and the moral of the story is this person is now heading policy development. Wow. They're now the But that's, that's one of my favorite stories. Like it's a small example of how it's really easy 
you know, to step back and say, let's do this together. We're a community. I don't have to discipline you and you don't have to be scared of me. We can do this together. Um, and luckily in home care, there's no end to conflicts and complaints that will arise. There is no end to really funny and quirky little things that will not happen in any other job. <laughs> you know? um, um, and I particularly like that scheduling is a really big, easy one, right, guys? <laughs> so, you know, if you embrace those challenges as growth opportunities for your co-op, it really, in my experience in like the past few years that I've been doing it, it's been the most successful strategy. Because what you're trying to do is help other people overcome their imposter syndrome too. You know, just like, I, you know, I was terrified of Deborah two years ago because my expectation was that I would be in trouble. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I learned over two years that that doesn't have to be the norm of my job. I don't have to feel scared and I have to help my new caregivers overcome that as well. And, um, and I think that's really important. So I, I can't stress enough on learning management skills so you can be a cooperative manager. Um, <laughs> and I see this as the administrator at Capital Home Care. But if you remember that every single person in your co-op is supposed to be a leader, they want to have their voices heard, you know, we're all trying to unlearn this bad system that we want to fix, you know, and create and envision something better and new. Um, and so uh, just returning uh, to kind of the things that I could hammer over and over again, facilitating open avenues of communication, inclusivity, learning to ask for help. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Um, learning to admit what you don't know. That's a skill. That's not a failure. Um, uh, that your co-op members are the leadership that you need. They will help you figure out the culture of your co-op. Um, and letting go of island management, operating from the idea that I'm on an island of struggle and no one here understands. They can't help me. Um, or having somebody ask me, hey, uh, why is scheduling this way? Or why do we have our checks printed out this way? And saying, you don't need to know that, you're the caregiver. You know, acknowledge is power in the cooperative. Empowering everybody, taking advantage of every exciting question that they ask and helping them to engage and understand the operations. You know, that's, we're here to do that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this last one, uh, saying, never mind, I'll just do it myself. I think that's a really, really easy thing for managers especially um, to fall into, especially if it's like your baby and you really want to make sure that, that it survives and you're at the board meeting and you're like, that's a stupid idea, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, um, it's really easy to get into this isolated island space where you're just like, I, I'm, I have a story, this one's really personal to me and probably one of the hardest things that happened for me at the co-op. Um, where I was operating in island management. For like the first seven months that we were open, I was doing everything myself. I was on call 24-7, I was filling the majority of the shifts, you know, I was doing payroll and invoicing and marketing and taxes and filing and just everything. I wore every single hat and I thought, that's my job as a manager. The caregivers wouldn't want to do this, right? That's the norm. Um, and so I, I kind of started burning myself out. <laughs> I ended up and I made a really bad mistake where I covered an awake overnight right before payroll. So I was up for like 40 hours. And by the time I got home, I, fe I fell asleep hard. <laughs> Nothing was gonna wake me up. And we had a relatively new 24 hour client where the overnight staff called out um, and couldn't come in and I didn't wake up. So this woman, this caregiver who'd been working a 15 hour shift, she had no relief. She was trying to call me, I didn't wake up. Um, so two kind of miraculous things came with this. The first one was that, you know, my caregivers rose to that occasion. This girl who couldn't find relief reached out to the other caregivers and one of them just went and covered it. Didn't even call me, just stayed, coordinated everything themselves that I had never seen before <laughs> in like 15 years of caregiving work. Um, and so the second thing that I did 
was I called an executive board meeting with our kind of ag tag board at that time, and I, I was like, Hail Mary, like, I need help. Like, this is, look what I did. Like, I would never allow for that as a caregiver. I would never be okay with someone not picking up the on-call phone. Like, how do I do this? Um, you know, just like Steve Carell, I, I didn't really believe that they would help me. You know, I, I believe maybe they'd like pat me on the back or say sorry, you know, and then I'd be like, you're the manager, that's your job, we're caregivers. Um, and that's the opposite of what happened. The minute that I gave these caregivers an opportunity to own their business, they were in it. You know, that word activated. I suddenly had somebody volunteering to take the phone for me on the weekends to help me avoid burnout. You know, we suddenly had strategies in place for if I got sick, which we didn't have before. You know, and for me, this was so meaningful. It was, it's such an important part of our club culture right now that we we all are relying on this hope. You know, and this. Uh, will to build something together. Um, and like I said before, smart people don't stay at a table where they're not listened to. Like me allowing these caregivers to own this business and rise to that occasion, you know, now these people are the board members, one of them is the assistant administrator, they're talking about developing a training institute, you know, they're really incredible. So they showed me, you know. <laughs> um, so some of my reflections on the story is just about member engagement and how powerful that is. Um, you know, we have all took on our imposter syndrome, go out into our community and we take, well, we do every, all of these things together. Um, we went to the Home Care Cooperative Conference, we met all of you guys. <laughs> you know, I think each of us over the years, like through our community, through all of you, through our support of each other, have started to feel like we're not faking it, like we're real business owners now. Um, you know, we continue to meet constantly to create systems, you know, and to, to just encourage each other to eat pie together. Um, and of course, we prioritize providing exceptional care. That's still right up there. Um, so we've come really, really far from the dark days of, you know, guns on the chair and <laughs> sleeping through the on call phone. Um, you know, and I, I can't. I can't stress enough like how it's the people in my cooperative who have made this an exciting, fun, safe job for me, you know, and made me see that my life and my workspace can be so much better. So that's that's all I have to say. people will just come and talk to me so there's been an, like I can't deny there's been an organic nature to it where honestly the caregivers just come in and gab for like two hours every week <laughs> but it's uh, I would say it's really about just stressing like like when somebody comes in and I think the people from Philadelphia might have said they had a strategy like this, like they don't do direct deposit and someone comes in and they're like, oh, cameras, cameras, like we're gonna do this. I, I do that, like people will come in and I'll be like, do you know at the board meeting we're talking about raises? You don't wanna miss that, you know? And stuff like that, you know, so you just make it exciting, you know, like people, and, and you work really hard. Like one thing I can say, I know Kirsten's really working hard on scheduling for the board right now is, 
we're not at a place where people don't want to come. Like most of the time, everybody really wants to be at those meetings, and that's a great and unique place to be. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? I don't think you guys so. I was just going to add, if you have meetings where you talk at your uh, workers, they're probably not going to keep coming. But yes. Like you said before about the smart people sitting at the table, like they need to be heard. And if they are and if they participate, they will come back. It's, that's so true. Like, that, I, it's funny you say that because I think everyone here knows that I talk a lot, so that was actually a huge issue for me. <laughs> not, not talking through the whole meetings, but it, it is really important, you know. And just like, you know, talking about the caregivers that stepped up during that hard time, like, they are facilitating that meeting now. Like, I am the administrator, I do my report, and they're in charge, you know, so it's very exciting. I was going to say, do you guys let the um, home care workers, like, get a chance to facilitate the meeting? Absolutely. Uh, so she asked if the home care workers are able to facilitate the meeting. So that's that's something, like I just went through a meeting, uh, a kind of a meeting training or facilitation training. Um, and I will just say, I believe that it's a best practice to have like a few people train in facilitation and to trade it. You know, if everybody understands the agreements of the meeting, that makes the meeting much, much easier. It's my experience. Any other questions? Um, I can just add on to the scheduling question. That's been an ongoing challenge, and I would, I'd love to hear more ideas for like how to schedule, or like maybe part of it I'm thinking is we can just have more frequent opportunities to meet, like Nora was saying, because um, we've had people say that they want to be at the board meeting, but they have a regular scheduled shift at that time. And so I've tried to reach out and just say, you know, if you really want to come, just talk to me and maybe we can find a way to cover your shift for part of that time or you know so that sometimes um, people who are working can come too um, but yeah I'm, I'd be interested to hear ideas on that too yeah oh go ahead maybe two different time slots like morning yeah and like the maybe like a four and then maybe like a late evening yeah and then maybe have like a calendar where on google where when you're having the meeting it automatically like sign it to their Google account and then be on their calendar. So if they happen to be off that day, they like, oh, we have a meeting today, I can make it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And so, have a uh, mm -hmm. switch off the time so it's not always the same time. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is he Jason's hand? Yeah, um, through the vast amount of agencies I've worked for, it's always been the absolute like concrete policy that no employee is allowed to have phone number, email, or communication access right. to your coworkers. Right. And the fact that I can actually, in a cooperative, you could actually have a, 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 a roll call or a directory and say, you need someone to cover a shift. I will help and work with the scheduler and find somebody that I don't have any way to contact. You know, and we're putting all of that on the scheduler and not right. on the caregiver. Right. You know, uh, the caregiver gets to be a partner and help the scheduler in that process and minimize on call calls. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I would say I absolutely believe having communication between the caregivers so that they can coordinate and figure out strategies too is a good idea. Um, yeah, scheduling, I mean, I like show of hands how many people are struggling with scheduling their home care co-ops. Oh, come on. You know it's more than that. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> Um, and one thing I can say is Capital Home Care, we're still really small, so figuring out how to scale up and keep that quality of consistent communication is going to be our next challenge, I think. Um, all right, I think, I think we did this in time. I was not expecting that. I'm so happy. Uh, well, thank you all for...